This is actually one of the most exciting uh, times. Uh, this, weekend, this week, actually, we learned uh, a tremendous amount that I'm going to share with you uh, uh, today. So a lot of information that you're going to see here is, is actually new. There's a lot leading up to it, but then there's a lot new. Um, I want to talk about architecture. Actually, I should have put architecture and planning. Uh, because both of those are absolutely critical now. And I was going to change it this morning, but I ran out of time. I was inserting all sorts of slides this morning. So anyway, I want to, I want to take you through um, kind of a story and then end up with where we are today and why this is probably right now one of the most important times for all of us. Um, uh, here today and how we can affect actually major change both nationally and globally. This was Louis Kahn. Um, when I was a freshman at Pratt, uh, the first lecture uh, I went to, uh, like the first week of school just like this, um, Louis Kahn uh, came to talk to us. And um, uh, I didn't know anything about architecture, but Louis Kahn went up to the blackboard and the guy could take uh, two pieces of chalk and draw simultaneously with both hands different things. So, it, it, I mean, we were like, you know, freshmen, we were like mesmerized by this guy. Anyway, he, he got up there and simultaneously with both hands, he's drawing straight lines on one side and a kind of a burst, a light burst on the other side. And his back is turned to us the whole time. He never turned, didn't turn around to even greet us when we walked in. He was looking at the blackboard. And then he started drawing. Then he wrote silence and light. Try it sometime. He wrote silence and light, same time with both hands. This is silence and this is light. And then he started drawing lines. He drew four lines, perfect, perfect, uh, perfect uh, curved lines connecting silence and light. And then he spoke, but to the blackboard. He said, silence to light. He said, at the threshold of this crossing is design. And he wrote design up there. And he said, design is a calling on nature. I was a freshman, didn't know anything what any of this meant, but it comes back to me all the time. And then he wrote, at that crossing design, we deal with space, time, and, our, and the environment. And that's the calling on nature. Well, in thinking about this over the years, since that time, we've really gone gung-ho on fossil fuels. And that has entered the mix it has entered design, right, and electrified this whole diagram. And what it's done is it eliminated time and the environment and left us with space so that architects can focus on space and form. And I'm going to put this into context so you actually see it visually, how this change happened. This is Marrakesh at 31 degrees north latitude, it's hot climate, kind of like uh, Albuquerque, maybe it lowers, so it's even hotter, dry. And you see all the buildings are donuts. And the reason they're donuts in Marrakesh, and this is the pre-industrial section of Marrakesh, so this is older, predates electricity and everything else is because you had to get light into every space. So you had a very narrow floor plate and you lit the space from both sides. And the reason they had donuts is they had a courtyard and they planted the courtyard and the courtyard looked something like that. So they planted it so there's a tree canopy on the courtyard and it became the outdoor, became an indoor outdoor living space. But at night the cool air, because there's a dry climate, you know, our temperature difference goes way down at night. The cool air would drop down into, this court, into the courtyards and it would cool off all the masonry surfaces and then the trees in the courtyard would keep the sun out during the day and it'd be a moderated temperature during the day. So time, space, and the environment 
all wrapped up into one in pre-industrial architecture. You also notice that from a planning standpoint, you can't even make out the streets. They're so narrow. And the reason they're so narrow is you don't want sun in the streets because you wouldn't be able to walk around otherwise. So maybe you'd let the sun in an hour a day at the most. And again, at night, the cool air would drop into these streets, cool off all the masonry surfaces because everything was masonry in Marrakesh. And then you'd keep the sun out during the day and you're actually able to navigate the streets during the day without overheating and having heat stroke in that climate. So again, planning, architecture, everything, space time and the environment all wrapped into one. This is the pre-industrial part of Vienna, or Austria, 48 degrees north latitude. So that's up in Canada somewhere. So it's a cold climate. But everything's a donut. Same thing. Very narrow floor plates. Again, you had to get lighting in from both sides. But the difference here is the planning. The streets are much, much wider. Because now you're in a cold climate. You want to get the sun into the streets. You want to get the buildings oriented right. So a typical building at that time would be a masonry building. It would have very high floor to floor. You can see a person there, young woman. You can see the floor to floor is like 20, 30 feet high. Vertical windows, bearing walls. So you had vertical windows. You had to bring the structure down on the bearing walls. You had vertical windows so you can throw light in. The higher the floor to floor, the higher the windows, the deeper the floor plate that you could do. And here's inside of typical building. Okay, so here's Toronto at the turn of the century. Roughly electricity came in right around 1900. And so here's 1891, right around that time. So these buildings are all pre-industrial. So you could see there's a person there. You can see again, 20 foot, 20 foot floor to floor, vertical windows, bearing walls. Now, keep your eye on the flat iron building to the left. We go from there to 2010. The flat iron building stays. But now look at the building right across from the flat iron building, the brick building. Flat iron building is a four story building with a half kind of basement and an attic space. So it's roughly four stories, four and a half stories. The building across the way, the brick building, is a nine story building. Floor to floor has come down. Look at the length of the depth of that building without windows. So at this point, floor to floor came down. You have big boxy buildings. We could climate control everything. We could make them out of glass. We can bring light in into the interior spaces so we didn't need donuts anymore. And so we went from pre-industrial to now modern buildings. So how did all this happen? How did that transformation happen? Well, back around 1900, during that time period, working conditions in England and the US were miserable. Wages were very, very low. People were packed into slums around the factories. All the housing was built around the factories. The factories were using coal. You'd have entire families in one room, two rooms. You'd have coal districts so that the buildings didn't get very much light. The walls were covered with black coal soot. In fact, you didn't even know they were brick buildings because the brick was just covered. You couldn't see the joints or anything else. So conditions were totally miserable. And things were, in socially, were at almost a breaking point. So a group of architects got together in the 1920s, in the early 20s, and then they held their first, com their first um, uh, large conference, Congress, they called it, the International Congress of Modern Architecture. And they hosted that in 1928, I think it was in Switzerland. And they decided to make an entire paradigm shift, huge. 
and they laid out a set of guiding principles for design, for architecture and planning from that point out, and then work to get it implemented. And it was guiding principles for really social justice and reform. And the planning principles, they call for function-based zones. Get the factories out of the housing so that you didn't choke everybody to death with coal and put the factories in its own zone, housing in another zone, and use the best land for the housing. Then they call for high-rise housing blocks in parkland and make the parkland ab abundant and then space the housing apart so that you got sunlight into every and light into every building rather than packing everybody into slums together. And then they called for, the automobile was coming in, the Model T was right at that period reaching its peak. Um, they called for free and efficient circulation. Instead of these narrow winding roads, they wanted straight thoroughfares through the city so that you can move goods and services and people. Those are the planning principles. At the same time, Le Corbusier, as part of that group, laid out the five points in towards a new architecture. So what was this architecture, was, were, what was it gonna be about? One is separate the column from the wall. No more bearing walls. So we didn't have bearing walls, we moved the structure inside. So we had free design of the facade. So now we can do what we wanted with the facade. We weren't now locked in to the 20 foot height floor to floor with the narrow windows, throwing daylight in. Now we could have long horizontal bands of windows because we didn't need to bring the loads down. And because we had point loads now and not walls, we had a free design of the plan, so now we could do all sorts of interesting things with the plan. And what was interesting was, he called for any space we took up on the ground, put it back up on the roof. It's kind of like the roof gardens today, green roofs. I heard that yours is leaking over here, but. Um, so this, so by 25, but in 25, this is, usually considered the first modern building, and it's the Bauhaus. And so you could see those principles, the guiding principles embodied here. Structure moves inside. You now have central heating, so you could heat the, 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 um, the wall area, and the wall is now hung from the structure. And so now you have essentially an all-glass wall. We go from that to the curtain wall, to the beautiful Lever House in New York in the 50s. By the 50s, modernism was now roaring and being taught in all the schools. That's back when I went to school, so that's what we were, that's, that's what we were um, uh, engaged in. Brasilia was the first city that was built on modern principles, and here you can see the wide boulevards, the housing blocks, space, and linear, linear roads and beautiful circulation patterns. But during that period, these were the tools that we had to work with in designing all this modern architecture. So essentially, the T-square and the triangle. That's why everything at Sao Paulo was either a square or a rectangle, all the buildings. The whole world was built out, all the way out to about the 80s, 90s in that configuration. We could do a half circle or a full circle or a quarter of a circle, but it, that was the only thing you could dimension because everything was dimensioned by hand. We actually had a French curve, but there was no dimensions on the French curve, so it was almost impossible to design anything more complex than a half circle and actually turn it into a construction document and get it built. So the world was built out with those two tools. Enter computers and computer-aided design and modeling and everything else, and now absolutely freed up space and form. So now the focus, we, we kind of blocked out 
the environment, we can now essentially design any form, any space, and actually dimension it and get it built. And the kind of structures that we're developing now are out of this world, essentially. And we're still building our cities out the same way, according to the same principles. The zoning, big roads, you see it in Turkey, you see it in China, you see it everywhere. Everybody's following the same model. So modernism freed us from the environment, from that connection, from time, and allowed us to focus and develop architecture and planning based on form and space and circulation and automobile and everything. And modernism at the time was revolutionary because it was a social justice movement. And the paradigm shift was absolutely radical and took root and changed the entire world. Now that brings us to 2017. We need a new paradigm shift. And this one needs to be as radical and revolutionary as the modern movement. And we have a time constraint. And I'll go into that in a minute. So why do we need this paradigm shift? And what is this time constraint? What is this all about? Whoop, let me go back. So I grabbed this off of the NASA website before they take it all down. So this is the average temperature and the red dot is where the temperature is at today. So that's where we are now. We're actually now at one degree C above pre-industrial levels in terms of temperature rise. Now you can see all those bunched up below the, the red one, there's a whole bunch in there and the one to the left where you see a big rise and then you see them all bunched up to the right, that's 1998. Let me see, can you see that? Yeah, so that's 1998. You remember in 2000, 2001, 2002, all the contrarians were saying, oh, there's no more, you know, global warming has stopped and the models projected to go up. Well, the models stair step it up, it goes up, you have an El Nino, it goes up, El Nino leaves, but the temperature stays still high. You get a bunch, you get another El Nino, it jumps up again, temperatures stay high, it goes up like that. But in order to get non-action, the fossil fuel industry and other interested parties, from 1998, from around 2000 on, said planet's not heating, models are wrong, scientists said no, we then got into fake science and all sorts of weird things. But anyway, three, four years ago, again, the stair step is over. We had an El Nino, goes up. Now, even without an El Nino, it's going up. So the going up now is really dramatic. You haven't heard anything more about the planet's cooling or not warming. Now the planet, we know the planet's warming, but it's not us. So that's the new mantra. But what the scientific community told me quite a while ago, Jim Hansen was on a panel that we had, Jim Hansen said at about eight tenths of a degree C, warming above pre-industrial levels, about eight tenths to one, you're gonna start to see what this thing is going to look like as the planet warms, because that's when you're gonna notice changes happening. And boy, have we noticed change happening. That's actually New Hampshire. That's a while back when New Hampshire flooded. Warmer air can hold more moisture. So when it rains, it rains harder and faster and more rain, drenching rain, and we get flooding. And we now had flooding, Harvey in Houston, 38 people 
and counting um, uh, uh, that passed away, we've affected 6.8 million and still counting in Louisiana. That'll add to that number. At the same time, last week and this week, that this was going on, halfway around the world, Nepal, India, and Bangladesh were experiencing the same type of historic, unprecedented monsoons. And Mumbai was totally flooded in that area. 1,200 people perished and 41, because it's a a much larger area and a lot denser. 41 million people so far have been affected. We have our own things to worry about here in the Southwest, and that's drought, dry areas. As we get drought, as the temperatures rise, we get a lot of moisture loss from, from, um, uh, from, our, from, our, um, uh, from our forests. So we get forest fires in the mountains. Um, and these then become now mega fires because they be so because they're so dry. Our water table uh, is going down. This is one of the reservoirs uh, two years ago. Um, on the coast now, we've got to worry about sea level rise. Sea level rise is huge for the United States. The whole southern part of Florida is actually gone with a few meters of sea level rise. It's amazing. Miami Beach, forget about it. One meter, it's it's totally gone because the under, under, what it's built on is like Swiss cheese. So whatever, wherever sea level is, that's where the water table is. Um, uh, so it is going to be absolutely devastating. We're losing coral reefs around the world to warmer temperatures, and the new normal is going to be really hot. This year has been absolute records everywhere. Um, they, had to, they had to develop new colors for Australia. It got so hot this year in Australia for a period of weeks. And Albuquerque is no stranger. And this is the projections for Albuquerque. Currently, there are 63, something like that, days over 90 degrees. And that's projected to go up to 139 days over 90 degrees. Business as usual. So this is if we keep doing what we're doing by 2100. Not only that, but I just discovered that Albuquerque came in second for the biggest difference between rural temperatures and the heat island effect in the city. I can't remember, but I think one was New York maybe. But anyway, is number two. And the average temperature difference between like Bernalillo and that area outside of the city and inside the city is about 5.9 degrees during the summer and could go up as much as 22 degree difference. That is enormous. And there's a great series in the New York Times a few months ago, Mexico City sinking. It's built on a layer of clay and the aquifers underneath that and as they're drawing out more water, they're not replenishing it because of climate change. They're drawing out too much water. The clay layer is sinking. And actually, the buildings now are starting to sink. Streets are sinking. Everything's sinking in parts of Mexico City. So just recently, now we have two big headlines. This was in June, so a few months ago. We have a 2020 deadline to avert a climate catastrophe. This is the, what the experts have said. And <clears throat> just a few weeks ago, Stephen Hawkins said, we're close to the tipping point where global warming becomes irreversible. Now, let me put that in context. These are the scenarios that were run by the scientific, the international scientific community and published as part of the IPCC report and given before to everybody, big countries, before we went to Paris and the Paris Agreement was ratified. It was when fossil fuel reduction, fossil fuels would peak and then start to decline. 
So they ran four scenarios. One is kind of business as usual, and then you kind of run out of fossil fuels. And it then levels, kind of levels out by about 20, 2080. And then they ran a peak of 2080, and then, and then a reduction. Then they ran a peak um, uh, of 2040, 2050, and then a reduction. Then they ran a peak of 2020, and a total phase out of fossil fuels by 2070, 2080. And so what would that do? So the only one that kept the temperature below two degrees C, which is what the international community has established as the absolute maximum, otherwise things are just get really bad. That scenario gave us a 66% chance of staying below two degrees C, but it also gave us a 33% chance of staying above, going above. And they said those odds are not good odds. So they ran a fifth scenario before Paris. And that was peaking between now and 2020, and then phasing out all fossil fuel CO2 emissions by about 2050, and that gave us a better than 85% chance, and that's called the 1.5 degrees C scenario. So you've all heard 1.5, 2, you've heard those numbers. These are the, this is what that all means. Why is that important? Because all the scenarios without the phase out, the planet actually sails past by roughly 2050 or earlier, sails past the two degrees C. And what Stephen Hawkins said is, I'm afraid we're almost at a tipping point. Climate change becomes irreversible. The planet actually keeps, up, keeps on warming. There's too much CO2 in the atmosphere and the inertia just it's kind of like a solar building. You keep getting hot days, hot days, hot days. The building gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Same kind of thing. So that's why climate change becomes irreversible. If that happens, it's a nightmare. That fourth scenario, and why we want the 85% chance, doesn't get up, that's called the 1.5 degrees, doesn't get up to two degrees. And actually, when you phase out by 2050, you actually start to bring the planet back into the climate that we've always known. It's going to take a few hundred years, 200 years, but slowly but surely, it comes back. And that is the only track that we can be on. That was presented in Paris to the countries. They adopted the 1.5 as the target. Okay, now it gets interesting. As if that's not interesting enough. Over the next 15 years, world urban population is expected to increase. This is 15 years, decade and a half, 1.1 billion people. Let me give you an idea of what that is. That's the equivalent of the entire population in the Western Hemisphere. Canada, US, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Central America. That's 1.1 billion people. We're going to build that out for 1.1 billion people in 15 years. It's unprecedented. Let me put it another way. That's an urbanization rate of 1.5 million people a week. That's building either a new city of 1.5 million a week or expanding cities by 1.5 million a week. Now, three days ago, why I said we now, all sorts of slides have gone into this thing, you're gonna see what's going on here. Three days ago, we went to a lecture and heard that the World Economic Forum just announced that we're urbanizing at the rate of three million people a week. We double that. Now, we're still waiting to hear back from the World Economic We don't wanna know where the number came from and all that kind of stuff, but that was presented in Davos, in Switzerland. If that's the case, we know population and we know urbanization is progressing at an exponential rate. That means it starts out slow, you get a doubling, a doubling, a doubling, a doubling, it goes up. But this doubling from 1.5 to 3 in that very short period of time means we're almost going vertical very, very quickly in terms of urbanization. It's either a blessing or it's a nightmare. We'll talk about 
Why both? In the US, we're expected to increase by 34 million people in the next 15 years, but we're going to urbanize 40 million people. So not only are people being born in cities, but people from the rural areas are moving into cities. So cities, not only worldwide, but in the US are absorbing the entire population growth from now on out to the foreseeable future. What we do know is where all the emissions are coming from. 75% of all human produced global greenhouse gas emissions come from cities. And that's where the problem is, and that's where the opportunity is. And that's why I say planning and architecture. And that's why we need a paradigm shift. In urban environments, what percentage of emissions are attributed to, to buildings? Because you have buildings, you have transportation, you have solid waste, you have all sorts of things, right? In New York City, it's 71%. In Seoul, where you're going, it's 63%. In Boston, 73%. So it's anywhere between 55 and 60%, where you have a motor-oriented city all the way up into the 70s, 80s. And even in some cases, we've seen 90% of all emissions come from buildings. So now, these are put in this morning slides. Jeffrey West is who we went to see a few, day, a few nights ago. He's a friend of mine, teach, is, works at the Santa Fe Institute, he's brilliant. In fact, he was one of our panelists at our first symposium when we first discovered this issue. And you can go and, ideas worth spreading, the surprising math of cities, you can Google it and watch his presentation. But I'm gonna give you a little piece of it right now on TED Talks. What we know is that exponential growth, the curve on the left, starts out and there's a, a, a kind of a story uh, explaining ex exponential growth. I'll, exp I'll go, go, through, go over it now. I think it's from France actually somewhere. But anyway, somebody has a, a pond and he's growing lilies in the pond, right? And he looks out and there's one lily and next day there's two lilies. And, and uh, then it keeps growing, and he looks out, and he's getting a little nervous, and the pond's about half full, and the lilies are growing exponentially, right? They're multiplying exponentially. The pond's about half full, and he's not too worried about choking off all the oxygen and the light down so that the fish die and everything else. He's watching his pond, it's about half full. So the question is, how long before the pond is totally full? How many days does he have left to deal with this issue. He's saying, well, I'm not going to worry. Well, he's got one day left. Because when you reach 50%, the next doubling is 100%. So it's 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. The numbers get big. When you get to 50%, it's the next day. So that's the exponential curve on the left. You can't keep growing exponentially without having a collapse, a total collapse because the numbers just get too big, okay? So on the right, you have a collapse. This is well known. This theory is well known and proved out. Okay, what Jeffrey went into was fascinating. He said, here's an exponential growth curve. He said, before you reach a collapse, and we've seen this in, in all, everywhere, in oil. Remember peak oil way back? We had an innovation, fracking. What the innovation does is before you reach a collapse, it extends out the time. Now we got more oil, we can, we're going to drive around more and everything else. Okay? So you get an, innova an intervention and an innovation, and it now extends out the time. But you're still growing exponentially. You start out small again, you, start, you, you grow, and you're going to collapse. Well now, before you collapse, you need another innovation, and we're good at that. So now we get another innovation, and goes up, but now it's going up 
the time frame is a lot shorter. So we need another intervention really quickly. Oh, and then we get another intervention. But now these things are coming fast. So before you get a heart attack, you're going to have to invent every day, and then every few minutes or whatever. So that's what this looks like. And we can see it in all sorts of things, and I'll show you in a minute. This is urban population blue. That's rural. You can see urban population, 1850, it's a few million, goes up, passes a billion in the 60s, and now look at the curve. It's an exponential growth curve. And we're at 2000, and now what we're seeing is it's not going out that way. Actually, if this thing from 1.5 million each week to 3 million, that's going up really steep. And then, so this morning, I plotted this, taking that whole Jeffrey's analysis, and I plotted Houston, okay? This is Houston population growth. And you can see, it started out in 1860, by the time it got to 1940, now the knee of the curve, and now you're at an exponential growth rate, okay? Then I plotted major floods, Houston floods, the years when there were major floods. There were major floods in 2001, 2006, 2008, 2015, 2016, 2017. Climate change is happening, but the growth also has reached an exponential point where it's going to be a total collapse. It's going to cost close to $200 billion to put that city back together. $200 billion. It's unbelievable. And then when's the next one? So, what ha so how did this happen? Well, in 1935, after the first flood, they built two huge reservoirs. So they moved the curve out. Just, that, was an that was an innovation, an intervention. They moved the curve out. Now they bought time. Okay, there's another flood. So now they have all these bios running through the city, and they're flooding. So now they channelized them, built up the walls, got rid of the water faster, built up the walls so they can hold more water. Between the 50s and 80s, they channelized everything, concreted it over. The great thing about Houston is there's no rules in development. Whatever you want to do, you can do. You want to cover the entire lot, you cover the entire lot. You know how we have, well, you can only cover so much of the lot. You have to have some green space. You have to let things percolate back. Not in Houston. Houston, anything goes. You want to put a factory? You want to put a chemical plant right in the middle of housing or build a housing around it? You can do that. Whatever you want to do, you can do. So they bought some time. Whoops. And that was it. Once you hit the, the around 2000, Climate change is happening, storms are more frequent, heavier rains, now they're out of luck. So now it's gonna cost $200 billion to build this thing back. Are they gonna build it back the same way? If they build it back the same way, you're gonna have $200 billion price tags every few years, and it'll be unsustainable. And the president goes down, oh, we're gonna help you out, we're gonna do all this stuff, they're gonna pass a $5 billion not going to do much. Okay. So what we need is a huge, I mean a transformative paradigm shift in architecture and planning. It is the only thing, the only thing that will solve the problem. The problem is cities, is urbanization, is how we build it out. The solution is cities, is urbanization, is how we design and build it out. The only thing that's going to save us from climate change is architecture and planning. End the story. No other thing is going to do it. It's you and me and our colleagues all over the world. That's what's going to get this done. Now. Okay, where are we? 
Is there a transformation happening? Have we begun a transformation? The issue is, remember that peak and then drop to 2050? We have to peak globally between now and 2020, three more years, and then start an emissions drop, start phasing out fossil fuels to zero by 2050. So what's happened? In 2003, we discovered the issue, and we discovered that we were part of the problem. We didn't know how big. We thought it was big, but we discovered it. So we issued in 2006. We then knew it was big, and we issued the 2030 target. We said, look, we got to design to carbon neutral by 2030 because we knew roughly, we didn't know it was 2050, but we knew roughly in the second half of the century we were going to have to phase things out. So by 2030, all buildings coming in carbon neutral. So this started in 2006. Immediately adopted by the Conference of Mayors, the AIA, God bless them, adopted it the day we put it out there. Unheard of in the history of the AIA adopting anything that fast. <laughs> but they adopted it. And they said, all architects need to do this. So they started a 2030 commitment. And if you look at the list, it's impressive. Every major firm is on the list. There's 400 architecture firms, which are monitoring their buildings. They're, they're, they're you know, designing to the targets. Are they meeting the target? No. Are they getting there? Yes. They're already at 38 percent, something like that, on the way. So they've dropped down actually quite a bit. All of a sudden, districts have sprung up all over the country, 20, 30 districts, going to a 50 percent reduction in the whole district, transportation, building, energy consumption, everything, water consumption, everything. There are now 17. New York is the next one coming out in a few weeks. You can't pick up a magazine without talking about sustainability, energy consumption, emissions, climate change, suburbia. You have Green Build, you have CNU. Books are coming out. I mean, it's all over the place. Does that mean we're all doing it? No. But does that mean things are shifting? Absolutely. There was nothing, nothing in 2006. California has a zero net energy code in 2020 for all residential buildings, new buildings and major renovations built in the entire state of California. It'll absorb about 20, 25 percent of the entire population growth of the U.S. That's how much California is growing. And by 2030, they want to have a zero net energy commercial building code. We're telling them you got to have a zero net energy commercial building code by 2020 also. And we're working now to help them develop that code, make it voluntary initially, but really push it. So here's our building codes, which regulate how we build, except maybe in Houston, but this is typical. For residential buildings, the 2015 code is all the way down from a typical building. The 2006 code, the 2015 code is on the scale of 100 being an average building in 2006, built the code, ZNC being carbon neutral, we're already down to 52 on the scale, halfway down. Title 24, 2019, which is coming out, has an efficiency bringing you down to 45, and then with on-site renewables, this is not off-site, there's just on-site renewables, getting you down to about a 24. So they're moving very quickly down to ZNC, and the number of cities now have ZNC codes in California, Santa Monica has one, for example. On the commercial side, our entire building stock in the U.S. in 2003, we pegged that as 100. Zero, zero net carbon. The entire building stock in 2012, when CBEX was done by the, by the feds, moved down from 100 down to 84 on the scale. So the entire U.S. building stock is getting more efficient. The 2016 code is down around 52. Title 24 is below 50 already, is down at 48. 
and Title 24, 2030, which we want to move up, is going to zero. So the codes are moving in the right direction. In 2005, we were at the maroon line. We were at 40 quads of energy in the US for the whole building sector. That's how much energy we used. And the projections were that we go up along that line over 56 by 2030. That was the projection in 2005. Dick Cheney came out, he had that private meeting with all the utilities, didn't tell anybody about it. And then it finally got into the papers and they were projecting like, I think 1,200, 1,300 new power plants needed in the US and they were gonna start building them like crazy. He got together secretly with the power sector. Everybody went berserk when they found that. Anyway, since that time, 2007, 2009, 2011, 2013, those are projections. In 2007, from 2005 to seven, actually we didn't go up, we kind of flatlined out a little bit, but then the projections were we gonna go up, but not that much, not as much. 2009, we actually went down energy consumption in the building sector, and the projections were, well, we'll grow, but not that much. 2011, we flatlined out, the growth came down. 2013, we actually went down, 2013, and almost level. 2016, we were down two quads, and the projections were that we were gonna actually go down between 2015 and 2030. Now, we built already, between 2005 and 2015, 20 billion square feet we've added. So we've not only made our buildings more efficient, we took up all the energy that all those new buildings were and we actually reducing in the US. And the 2017 number just came out and that's down even further. So we're moving since 2005. The architecture community, we know they're moving. We know everybody's moving in that direction. The codes are getting better, everything's moving in that direction. Is it enough? No, but we'll get to that in a minute. That's Dick Cheney's 1,200, 1,300 power plants that we don't need and never built. This is greenhouse gas emissions. Again, the projections in 2005, emissions in the building sector would go up. By 2013, they had actually come down and they were flat. 2016, big drop. 2017, even greater. Huge drop. And since 2005, our emissions in the building sector is down almost 30%. The reason is we've not only dropped energy consumption, but a lot of that is due to fuel switching from coal to natural gas, which buys us some time. It's one of those interventions that buy us some time. But as we build out and we use more gas and more gas, we then get into the same problem. We need another innovation and intervention. We know that the UIA adopted 2050 as the phase out for all carbon emissions in the building sector. We introduced the China Accord and got all the firms, both US firms that are over in China with offices in China and all the large Chinese firms to try to design the carbon neutral standards or as close as they can get. We got them to sign on, and we then brought that to Paris. In Paris, we got a buildings day, first time ever. They acknowledged that the building sector was part of this problem. And the US, after we kept hammering, everybody kept hammering at the US to join the ambition coalition of keeping it at 1.5, two days before signing, they finally joined, and then China joined, and everybody joined, and we got the we got the thing signed. So what, what the long-term goal said is that we were gonna keep temperature increase well below two degrees C, preferably shoot for that 1.5. And that's where we have to be. Since Paris, now this is absolutely fascinating. 533 cities worldwide. We also realized in Paris, cities were it. 533 cities 
said they were going to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions. That was up from 70% before that. Globally, of the 533, 190 have targets for how much they're going to reduce. In the U.S., 131 cities of that 533 have agreed to disclose their carbon emissions, and 74 have targets. Then the president withdrew from the Paris Agreement. U.S. to leave Paris Accord, Climate Accord, what happens now? Let me tell you what happens now. Seven th it went from 533, 7,400 mayors now vowed to not only give their carbon emissions, but also create a plan to reduce them. 7,400 in a matter of weeks. So we went from 533 to 7,400. In the U.S., we went up to 372 cities have committed to the actual 1.5 degrees to phase out fossil fuels by 2050. Do they have plans in place? No. They just all of a sudden said, we're going to do this. Now they're all scrambling around to develop plans. That's the new frontier. California stepped into the U.S.'s shoes and said, you're not going to do it? We're going to do it. And not only that, we're going to collaborate with China. China said, we want to be a, ma we want to be a major player on the world stage. What better opportunity than to fill in for the U.S. on climate change? We're going to flatten out our emissions, and now we're going to start to reduce them. India joined the chorus. Why is California, India, and China so important? This is the emissions graph. That's China's emissions, way up there. They have now flatlined, so they peaked. U.S. has been going down slightly, and we see that in the building sector. India, however, is now on a curve that's going to bend up like crazy. So we'll be in India in a few months. We've got to turn that around. If we turn that around, global emissions start to then peak from 2020 on. That's why I say cities, architecture, and planning paradigm shift, critical if we're going to save lives, communities, cities from a lot of destruction. So how do we do this? We know we have to phase out. You know, we know that 2050 date. So how do we get the carbon neutral in planning and architecture? It's actually not that difficult. It's a two-step process. Step one is information. If you know what you're doing and you know what you're planning, you know how to plan and you know how to do this stuff, you can get 70 to 80 percent of the way there. And then the other 20 percent is technology. So what's the 70, 80 percent? It's everything we know about, transit-oriented developments, public transportation, walkable communities, walkable streets, passive solar heating and cooling technology. I mean, it goes on and on. Orient the building right, daylight the building. I mean, everything, we know it all. There's no magic here. It's just learning it again and then doing it. Gets us 70 to 80 percent of the way there. Step two is renewables. Both on-site and the key is off-site is being able to import renewables to get yourself to zero net carbon. Why? Think about it. Everything that's going to be built now is urban. In urban areas, the footprint is small. The roof area is teeny. The amount of square footage is huge. There's no way you're going to generate all that energy in the building, on the roof, or even on the walls. One building's going to shade another building. Compact development actually is an energy saver, but you can't produce it on site, so you have to import it. So if you don't allow to import it, we get this utopian idea, every building's going to produce all its own energy. It's insane, especially since every building, 99% of the buildings can't do it. So you have to allow for off-site to import. So you reduce 70 80%, big deal. You import 20%, 10%. 
so for us, okay, we've taken a look at all the strategies. We put them into the 2030 palette. It's all online. It's free. It's a whole list of litany of strategies that you can use. The great news is there's all these programs now. Sapphire, real-time simulation. Sapphire, you're designing a building, you turn it, you put glass in, gives you, are you meeting the targets, are you below the targets? It's a little dial that goes up and down as you're designing. It's like a computer game. You get down into the green, you're good. You go above it, you're in the red, no good. Bad decision, turn it the other way. 360, inside 360, the same thing. Edge now, and 121 countries, I think, is another program for all the developing world to get to zero. The problem is, the bottleneck in all of this, I'm sorry to say, is academia, is you guys. That's the bottleneck. This is not happening in where? In design studio. If it doesn't happen in design studio, it doesn't happen. If it's an adjunct course, it's absurd. It has to happen in design studio. You need a paradigm shift in every professional school in this country, and you need to do it quickly. So we need to transform design studio. What we need is, if you're an instructor, just give the problem out. If it's housing, okay, it's housing. You have a whole program, everything else. Just say, get as close to carbon neutral as you can in your housing. If you're an instructor, you don't even have to know how to do it. Let the student go out, you go on an internet, you could use Safari, you could do a million things. <laughs> you don't have to know anything. Just give the damn problem out. As one of the criteria. You gotta make the building stand up. Well, make it use no fossil fuels also. Okay, to help you guys out, we're running a student faculty design competition called Innovation 2030. Starts the day you walked into school today. We're gonna give you, we have only three criteria. And don't worry about any other criteria they put on, the AIA puts on, three criteria. Energy and emissions, get it down as close to zero as you can. Adaptation, you're gonna rebuild places. And if you're gonna, if we know, if we know the heat island effect is coming big time here, we better design for it now because those buildings will be here 50 years and then resilience so that they can operate after some of these things happen. So those are the three criteria in the competition that the judging will be on. And there's $20,000 in student prizes, $20,000 in faculty prizes. The students, however, get paid summer internships, the winners, at a firm of their choice and we're signing up firms like crazy. Whoops. These are some of the firms, SOM, NBBJ, in cities all around the country. You win, put your first choice down, we'll try to match you up. Each one is giving out a few internships. If there are too many that want to go to SOM, you'll have a first, second, third, fourth choice, something like that, and we'll match you up with somebody. And you get paid for the summer if you win. So these are some of the firms that are already signing up. And we'll have probably another 15 or 20. We have another five already, that six already, that signed up before I made this. And not only that, if you win, you're on the main stage in New York. You'll get a stipend to go to New York. And student, you're on the main stage, and your work will be exhibited there. You get announced on the main stage of the New York AA convention next year. For the faculty, you not only get the money, but you then get a $1,500 all paid invitation to the night before at a very fancy hotel is the Design Futures Council Forum on the Design Education, where faculty, deans, the profession gets together and discusses all sorts of things about design education. It's actually, these are incredible sessions and they're very well done. They cost a lot of money for people to come. You guys get to come 
for free, the winners, the ones who actually give the problem out to the students and help the students win the competition. Now, I showed this 2004 in Pittsburgh to a group like you of just scientists, no architects, no engineers, scientists. It was a big conference. For some reason, they asked me as the keynote speaker. So I gave them a problem. You give scientists a problem. I said, okay, this is Seattle, Chicago, Albuquerque, Atlanta. I'm gonna give you how much energy falls on the roof in thousands of BTUs a square foot a year in these floor, four very different climates. And then how much energy falls on the facade, average, over the year. Okay, so these are averages. Takes into a cloud, cloud, cloud cover, rain, everything. So this is how much energy falls in Seattle. You can see Albuquerque, it's through the roof here. So it's 700,000 BTUs a square foot a year. Seattle's about 400,000. That's how much energy falls on the roof over the year, square foot, in those climates. So I said, scientists, this is how much energy falls on the south facade over the year. In Seattle, a little bit less than 400. In Albuquerque, still huge, up about 500. Atlanta, Chicago. Now I said, scientists, this is the U.S. average energy consumption. This is average. This was 2003. We're better than that now, but this was 2003. This is how much energy an average residence uses per square foot, square foot to square foot, in KBTUs a square foot a year. So same, same thing, 42,700. This is how much a commercial building uses per square foot. Okay, so I said, okay, scientists, I am going to now say if we build it today, it's half of that, because you saw on the graph, right? We went down from the 2003, the average building, if you build it to code, you're down around 50. So in the red bars, that's how much energy they need per square foot. So I said, okay, here's the problem. This is how much energy in Seattle. It's cloudy almost every day except maybe in the summer, a few days it breaks through. That's how much energy falls on two surfaces of a building in Seattle. That's how much energy a residence needs in Seattle, in the red, in the bright red, okay? Now, scientists, raise your, and we know that that's intermittent, south side, it's intermittent energy. Okay, so it doesn't all come at the same time you need that energy in the little red bar. Raise your hand if you can't solve this problem. <laughs> so now I ask you the same question. Raise your hand if you think, given Tesla and all this other stuff that's going on now, raise your hand if you think you can't solve this problem. You can't solve it? Did you say can or can't? Can't. can't. Oh no, you can solve it. Okay, good. <laughs> Even she could solve it. Okay. It's not rocket science. This is the key. So, I hope you enter the competition. I hope each faculty member gives that additional criteria. Don't change the problem you give out today. Or tomorrow. It's a hospital, it's a house, it's, it's, you know, a coffee shop. Whatever the problem is, design it carbon neutral. That's all. And if you don't know any, let the students figure it out. They got to do a pinup, right? After the first week, let them do the research, pin up. What did they find? You'll learn more from the students than if you try to do it yourself. <laughs> so we hope to see you we hope there's a whole slew of winners. There are 10, there are gonna be 10 winners. The winners are limited to a three students per team. Could be one, two, or three students. So, be a lot of winners. We hope there's a real good group of you coming from New Mexico.
So, paradigm shift, it's up to us. There's nobody else, the federal government, the, there's just nobody else going to do it. If we don't do it, it's not going to happen. And then, the responsibility is pretty awesome, but the opportunity is incredible. Thank you. Yeah, we can take a few. So we're going to take a couple of questions. Um, I just wanted to mention something myself. I was on the jury of the previous version of this competition uh, last year, and I found it very difficult to find winners because it was so complex, what was expected of the students. And the really wonderful thing about this version of the competition is that it's set up to make it much more viable for students to take on those three primary issues. And I really hope that a lot of you take this very, very seriously. It's, it's, a, design, it's a design and ideas competition. It's not a numbers competition. It's a design and ideas. And we picked out a great jury, which we'll announce uh, probably in a week. We'll announce the jury. Some, some great people, Studio Gang and ZGF and just. Great. So who wants, who's got questions? Don't be shy. Catherine. Do you see a role for landscape architecture? Say that again? Do you see a role for landscape architecture? Absolutely. The reason, one of the reasons given for the extreme flooding in Houston is that they paved over everything. They didn't landscape the area. They didn't use pavers with spaces or permeable paving, things like that. Um, uh, uh, heat island effect in Albuquerque. We know that the tree canopy is critical to reducing the temperature in the entire city. So there's all sorts of landscape architecture is key. All, when I say architecture, I'm talking about all the architectures, not just architecture, building architecture, but all the architectures, absolutely critical. And if you look on at the 2030 palette, a lot of the, I would say half Half of the elements on there have to do with things that landscape architects are responsible for. Another question. Back there. Uh, so this is really inspiring. Um, uh, definitely. Uh, one of the questions I have is, is we can design or have ideas about what we want to do, but when does the when does it shift to where it's cost effective? Right. The question, question is cost effective and what about the clients? It's a great question because I get that question every single time I give a lecture. But usually it comes in a different form. It comes, my client doesn't believe in this stuff and doesn't want me to do that. I said, I said, wait a second. I said, you're not really telling me the truth. I, I said, I practice now for 50 years. I've never had a client come over and say, Ed, look, I don't want you to save me money on a monthly basis. I want to spend as much money on utilities as I possibly can. Don't design the building. Oh, yeah. No, no, don't design more, it. More greenhouse gases. Yeah, yeah, I want to spend the triple. I want to triple. <laughs> never. What, the slide I showed, 70 to 80% of the way there, down, is design. No cost, low cost options, cost savings options. How do we know that? We know it from the 70s and the, and the 80s during the solar movement. The DOE gave out millions of dollars for architects to design buildings at no additional cost and see how far they can get down. Everyone was getting down 60, 70, 80, 85 percent, just design strategies in terms of energy consumption. So. We know we can get down that far. The rest is on-site renewables, yeah, cost something. But now, payback is good. You know what, the price, back in the 70s, you couldn't afford one collector. Cost a fortune. Now, you go, you can buy them at Ikea. They're giving them away. 
you want, oh, you want a panel? Here's a, here's a bunch of panels. Can you take them off my hand? They're so cheap. Now, the key now is storage, obviously. That's somewhat expensive, but if you tie into the grid and you have good policy where they're actually paying you because they don't have to build a power plant to generate electricity, the payback is really quick, really quick. So it pays. And now there are, I don't know how many loan programs that you can get money to do this stuff. And there's on-bill repayment. It means you don't even have to put out a penny. Stick the damn collectors up and the money you save goes to pay off the, the collectors. So there's no excuse at this point or any rational excuse for not designing to zero net carbon, which means then if you, you pay, what, half a cent more to buy renewables, you start forcing the utilities to build, build them if you opt in to that. So anyway, that's a great question. Get it, get it all the time. The answer is always the same. Let's take one more back there. What's your opinion on what's going on on Central, the transportation project art? You know, I just, it's the first time I drove down Central in I don't know how many years, and it's all, I don't know what's going on down there, so I'm, I have a hard time. It's a rapid bus. Oh, is it? And it's been very controversial. Um, a, ra a, a ra rapid bus. A rapid bus. Yes, with dedicated lanes. Ah, uh, interesting. There's been some, some, some controversy, let's say. There's been some anger, frustration, partly funded by a particular a company that uh. might have heard of. Well, bus rapid transit in developing countries is becoming um, a, a viable option to reduce congestion and the cost. The, you know, you remember the curve, right? And then, then an innovation. And then, okay, so what's happening in cities? In cities, cars are congesting everything, right? I can show you some cities. It's in China, it's outrageous. In, in India, it's unreal, stuff like that. In the US, the kids now, the next generation, don't want cars, right? They want to use public transit, they're coming in. Cities now have to adapt to that. Yesterday, there was a guy from Ford Company on, our companies are in danger because we're urbanizing so quickly and the cities don't want cars anymore in the cities. And if that's where all the growth is going to take place and everybody's moving into cities and the population's growing, we're not going to be able to sell our cars. So what are they doing? They're trying another innovation and inter intervention before they collapse to move cars around <laughs> more quickly so that people don't get totally upset and want to buy a car and want to buy cars. So that's the way. So that's how that thing works all the time. But I think and they're banking on electric cars, and they're banking on hopefully renewables generating the electricity for those cars, so they reduce they reduce emissions. We'll see what happens with that one. But that's a, that's just that's a perfect example of that curve where the car companies now have grown so fast. There's so many cars out there. There's now total congestion. There's going to be a collapse in cities, and they're going to move away from cars and toward public you know, public transportation, and the car companies are now freaking out about selling, about keeping their products going. All businesses grow exponentially, and at some point, they die. Pretty much everyone. Then the new ones come, same thing happens. They do interventions or innovations, they keep going, but at some point, They've got to innovate so quickly that they can't. The next guy comes along, and it's some whole new paradigm. That's what we need in architecture and planning and city development. In 30 years, we've got 30 years to solve this problem, actually, but we need to be on the downside. So we don't have to do it tomorrow. Every city needs to be this. It's 30 years. In 30 years, Albuquerque will look totally different. Oregon, I went back to the University of Oregon to give a lecture 20 20, 25 years after I had been there, I hadn't been back. I didn't recognize the place. So we have plenty of time. Houston will be rebuilt, $200 billion. Hopefully they'll rebuild it now in a whole different way. We'll see what, we'll see what happens. They have an opportunity. If they don't, they'll experience another 
major, maybe the one coming right down the pike now, they'll experience another one and be wiped out again if they don't do it, don't do it right. Thank you. Eddie. Thank you.